Hey, what's going on, guys? My name is Nick, and welcome back to another episode of Technical. It's the show where Nick talks tech. I'm your host, Nick, so let's talk tech. And this video is coming to you at 24 frames per second. Or is it? We often hear that video is just a series of pictures, all shown one right after another. Flipping through a bunch of still images really, really quickly can give the illusion of motion. But there's a catch, and that involves how the images are taken and how they're played back. We can think of video in terms of pixels, right? Each image or frame of video is composed of hundreds or thousands or even millions of pixels. Instead of trying to count each pixel individually, let's handle them line by line. So in a 1080p video, there are 1080 lines of pixels. But what does the P stand for? Well, it stands for progressive. Progressive scan video displays both the even and odd scan lines, which is the entire frame of video, sequentially, meaning line by line from top to bottom. You may have also seen 1080i, which stands for interlaced. Interlaced video displays even and odd scan lines as separate fields. Fields meaning sets of lines. So in this case, we have two, one for the even scan lines and one for the odd scan lines. So the odd lines will be displayed on the screen first and then the even ones will fill in after. Each set of scan lines, one even and one odd, will make up an entire image. So for a 30 frame per second video at 1080i, each field will be displayed for 1 60th of a second. This is why if you've ever tried to film an old TV, it would flicker. The frame rate of the camera and the refresh rate of the TV don't quite match up. Now you may be thinking, Nick, why on earth would I ever want to shoot or display my video in an interlaced format? This is, this is my impression of you typing your comment, by the way. And that's a great question. Because you're displaying every other line of video, you're technically doubling the perceived frame rate without adding any additional information. Showing each half frame really, really quickly can make the audience think that there are more frames than there actually are due to persistence of vision. This can also help to reduce flicker between frames. So sign me up, right? Let's interlace all the video and get more frames. Well, you might not want to. You see, interlacing can cause problems like combing. And I don't mean for your hair. I'm not, I'm not putting that in there. Where the even lines of the next frame have loaded onto the display, but the odd lines of the previous frame are still being shown as well thus giving you an image that's half of frame A and half of frame B. Now this doesn't always cause problems, but for something like a fast moving object, it's going to start to become noticeable. And that's exactly what broadcasters have to deal with, or at least had to deal with. I don't really know since I don't watch TV anymore, but for a long time, broadcasters would choose to display a lower quality progressive video over a higher quality interlaced video. So for example, they might choose to show a 720p image rather than a 1080i image. This would allow for broadcasters to save on bandwidth when sending you an image. So broadcasters in charge of sports would often send out a 720p image rather than a 1080i image for better motion of fast paced sports without having to use up any more bandwidth, thus sacrificing some quality for better motion. You can kind of think of it like compressing a WAV file down to an MP3, but compression's a video for another day. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. Lots of older TVs and cameras had to use interlacing because of limitations in the medium. You'll find interlacing more prevalent in old analog TVs or early HD TVs, and even some DVDs too. The old analog TVs like CRTs displayed the interlaced video without much issue. But when the switch came to HD, TV manufacturers had to find a way to de-interlace the footage that was being originally broadcasted. That way it would show up properly on the newer devices that only supported progressive video. And there are a bunch of different algorithms that can do this, including field combing deinterlacing, field extension deinterlacing, and motion compensation deinterlacing. All of these work with varying degrees of success. But modern day computers and monitors can display progressive video without much issue. And there are some camera articles I've read saying that progressive formats and cameras are more expensive than interlaced ones. But that isn't necessarily true nowadays. It's actually pretty accessible to get a camera that can shoot in a progressive format. And if you're uploading videos to YouTube or the web, you might as well get a camera that can shoot in progressive formats anyway. But hey, you might already have one in your pocket. So here's the big question. Is this important? Kind of. I think most internet creators default to a progressive format nowadays. But understanding the history and why we have these options can help you make more informed decisions, especially if you're starting a career in television. Well, that's it for this video. Do I leave something out or get something wrong? Let me know in the comments down below. I put my sources in the description so you can fact check me. And while you're down there, please go ahead and like the video, ring that bell for notifications, and subscribe so you don't miss another video. I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Bonus fact. Most of those articles I mentioned that say that progressive video is more expensive were written a while ago. Times have changed.